Hi CIS 18A, this is part one of week five lecture. Uh, we are going to cover chapter eight and 16. If you purchase the book, I encourage you to look at the additional chapters. It's going to help you gain more insight about Java programming. But for this class, we cover from one through eight. And lastly, chapter 16, which covers swing. So in this week, <clears throat> we are going to touch on packages interface and swing which is the graphical user interface package in java so in unit 5 module you will find the to-do list and on the to-do list we are to read chapter 8 and 16 we are to complete unit 5 notes uh, look it over and then complete lab 5 the only Outside assignments we have this week is going to be lab five. You can also attempt extra credit for uh, the quizzes game for quiz two. There is a quiz that's going to be due at the end of the week. So make sure you take the quiz. This is going to be the last quiz. And please dedicate time to complete the final review assignment. That's going to help you prepare for the final exam next week and also to work on your project. If you're finished with your project, make sure that you submit all parts of your project, which is due on the 11th of February, um, 10 days from now. So we need to focus on um, working toward our project, completing it. And I had sent out an announcement regarding late assignment submissions and also the due date for the final exam and project. Final exam will be open next week on Monday and it's going to close on Thursday at 11.59. So you do have a few days to get the final exam complete. However, I do not allow fi late final exam or late project submission because I have a very small window for me to complete your grade for the course and get that um, in entered into WebAdvisor. So basically we have to complete everything by the 11th so that way I can finalize your grade. Um, if you have any questions, please see me during office hours or please schedule an appointment so that way we can discuss possibility of your project or your assignments or any concern you have. So as you look through the module, you can download the unit five notes. Um, to start, we're going to talk about chapter 8, which covers packages, um, importing packages and interface. And package, custom packages are, one custom package is going to be required for on your course project. And you can implement interface with the package. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about swing at the end. So I'm going to divide up this video into two parts, and this is part one. So to begin, we're going to talk about package and basically we built package to uh, make our program modular. Um, we can use the packages that are already pre-made and you have done this before when you import java.io or you're using different type of packages that are available via Java community. Um, in this chapter, we're going to learn how to create our own packages. And in a package, you can have a group, a group of classes. Um, and think of it kind of like how C++ have struct and you can group up different types and also classes under struct. But in this, what we can do is we can create a Java file that consists of different classes. And we define those classes for the package. Now, when once we create the packages, we can use our main program to access the packages for different functionality. So in the first point, it points out that the mechanism for a package is to relate pieces of the program so that way it can be one unit. So let's say that you have a program for human resource and you can have a package that's going to be for their payroll. Um, another package would be for employee schedule, etc. 
and all together you can combine them to make it an entire program. And classes are usually defined within the package so that way it will be accessed throughout the package name. Last week we talked about inheritance and how we would be able to access members and member methods across the class so you would apply the same concept when you design your package. Um, in the second point, it talks about how package participates in access control mechanism. Just as I mentioned, classes are defined within the package, can be made private, um, so that way you can limit the access, or if you want it accessible, then you can make it public. However, private will give us a little bit more control in what not to be accessed outside of the, the package itself. So you can implement the specifier um, for your class and be able to control what is accessed as variables and methods from a certain package. And I highlighted a few things on the first page. It talks about no classes can use the same name and namespace. And we touched on this before, starting from the second week, um, we started looking into implementing multiple classes. So if you are designing a package with two or more classes, you cannot use the same name from the same namespace. So the namespace of each of the class must be unique. And as you construct the object, you will bring down that class name. And so that object will be related to that class and it's able to access based on how you specify the components in that class, uh, various areas of your class, like like variables and methods. And the reason why we don't want to have the same name is we want to avoid the name collisions. Um, and possibly sometimes you will work with different programmers on the same project where you have same name or problems with the same name. So we want to make sure that the name in the package is going to be unique as it is attached to each class and to avoid the name collision in other classes, the name in other packages, we want to make sure that we see and, and categorize our namespace so that way it's going to be unique. So in a package, you simply start with creating the package by defining the package. And you're going to use a statement with the keyword package. So that way we know that that's a package we're using and we can give it a name. Now, the default package has no name, which makes it default package and transparent. But the default package is usually for short sample program. It's inadequate for real world application. So therefore we wanted to give it a unique name and in it we would define the classes for specific functionality. Like I mentioned with the human resource example, in that we would have a package to schedule our, uh, our employees and another package to um, calculate their pay. Um, or a third package for employee benefits registration and updates, etc. So here in the middle of the page, it shows you how you can write a statement to define your package. So you would start with the keyword package and you would give it a name and finish that statement with a semicolon. Now, an example from the text, <coughs> you would use something like this, package my pack. And it's important that you put this file with your main program file. It needs to be in the same directory. If you store it in a different location, when you run it, you gotta make sure that you put in the path so that way they're tied together. Uh, normally we would package, we would include the package in our source code folder so that way we can access different components in that package. So Java uses the file system to manage packages with each package stored in its own directory. So once you create that, it will make a subdirectory and it would create a folder 
within the main area that you store your programs. So in this example, we have a package called my pack and the dot class files for any of the classes that you declare for your package my pack must be stored in the same directory called my pack. So you have to make sure that it is stored in that folder and the folder is named my pack. It's important that you do that so that way it can identify the files based on the organization of the file system so that way your main program can access all its components including its package. Um, Note that the package name is case sensitive. So if we use a capital letter M for my pack and we're trying to use the package with a lowercase m, it will not be able to find it. So keep in mind that your package names are case sensitive. So it needs to be exact as you include it in the main program. So the directory also for the package, the naming of that directory must also be precise. It has to be exactly like the same name as your package name. Otherwise, it would not work. So that's important to highlight. And so when you run into, in, into issue with the lab, you need to make sure that you ask yourself a few questions. Number one, do I have the same directory or folder name as my package name and number two the package itself is it stored in that exact directory um, call my pack or however you name your package so that's important to remember when you create your packages this week and for the final project um, for the package statement, simply just specify which package the classes are defined in the file. So when we specify multi-level package statement, we can have package and we can have pack one, pack two, pack three, and pack n like this, where you would have hierarchy of packages so for example, if I hire a new employee and I'm creating a, a, a program for this new newly hired employee, I might have some hierarchy in the packages, for example, to register their background and their information on the first package, and then also their health history for uh, benefit registration in the second pack, and so forth, and we can link them all together and we can have some hierarchy where there are different classes in the packages can be um, inheriting uh, members from all other classes throughout the packages. So in this case, when you're using multiple packages as hierarchy structure, you need to create directories that support the package hierarchy that you made. So it's really good to think about how you would map out. We would have a top level pack one. Under pack one, we would have pack two. Under pack two, we might have pack three and four, etc. So that way it would flow sequentially as it, it is accessing the files and the components of the Java files. So in the example here, we have a package called alpha and under that we have another package inheriting from alpha is beta and another package from beta is called gamma. So the way that we would store it is the top level folder is going to be alpha and under alpha we would have a subfolder called beta and under beta, we would have gamma folder. And so when we're creating the main program, we want to specify the path accordingly to really define where these files are based on that path. So you would use the slashes accordingly to separate the folder and ask 
beta and gamma is a subfolder of beta and beta is a subfolder of alpha. Now for the Java runtime, by default, Java runtime uses the current working directory as it starts, its starting point. So that's where it's going to start is the, the main directory. So going back to our last example, it's going to start at alpha. Then if the package is in the subdirectory of the curtain directory, then it will be fine. It will be found. So it's going to find beta under alpha or gamma under beta. So it is a breadcrumb for Java runtime to be able to identify where is the current working directory or the file for your program. So, um, the, you, the thing that you can use is a class path option in Java. So when you issue Java C, you can simply compile specific path by specifying where those files are located, which folder or folders in the subdirectories of the main folder is gonna, is the system gonna find your files. So the option for class path allow you to use the path of your package directories. So in order for our program to work and you're going to experience this when you're doing the lab, the program can be executed from a directory immediately above the my pack. So what you would have is you would have to change directory to the folder outside of my pack to be able to see it. If you're in my pack, and you won't be able to see the actual file. So let's say that I have my pack under desktop. What I would need to do is I would need to do change directory command, which is CD. And I need to go to the desktop. So that way the system can then start at the desktop to see the my pack subdirectory, which contain your package file. Or what you can do is you can use the class path. You need to specify where those files are located. So we have to say that it's located on, on desktop under my pack. So that way it would be able to point to the location of the package. And this is important to highlight. I, uh, explain this in my tutorial videos for the lab. So please take a look at those. So that way you can understand how to be able to set up your package directory and be able to access it from command line. Now, if you're using IDE, IDE, some of the IDE would automatically set some of this up as, you know, you, you write the package file. However, understanding the basic components like this in Java programming concept is essential because you might not be able to access, have access to fancy IDE when you go out in the, into the workplace. Uh, you have to be able to understand how the hierarchy of the packages work when you work with other programmers that are writing the packages. So um, it's best to keep all the .java file and the .class files associated with the package in the package directory. So earlier we have a my pack. What we need to do is make sure that our .java file and .class file for my pack is together and it's in the my pack directory. When you compile, you need to compile from above the the directory before that the outside directory like i said in desktop where it would contain your my pack so if you have a folder called java and you store all your java lab files there my pack is going to go inside the java folder so when you compile you need to be at the java folder in order to see my pack so you need to compile at the uh, the directory above it so 
Here is the example of the package book pack. So we create, we define a package. Its name is book pack. And so this file is going to be part of the book pack package. So I have to make a folder called book pack and it needs to be exactly as the name is typed. Then we have a class called book and book class is part of this book pack package. We have private members for the book. And here we started constructing objects T, A, and D for title, author, and publication date. We have a member method under the class book called show, and we simply print out title, author, and public date for that method. Then inside the package, we also have a second class called book demo demo and in book demo we have a main method in this under main method we have an array and this array contains it we construct an array object which contain five elements we see that here each element would represent one book and each of the book would be associated with the title, the author, and the publication date. So now in this case, what will happen is this class, book demo, is also part of book pack. Earlier, we called that we have, we have book pack package, a class book, objects for that class, private members and then we have another class under book pack that's going to be book demo and in it we would have an array where it would store information about each element or each book because it's an array we would use a for loop to iterate through each element so that way we can display each book information starting with the first element is book zero so we're gonna go book zero it's gonna show Java beginners guide the author and the publication date and so as it iterate through this it's gonna go to the end of the array which is the dot length so it's gonna display five books as each one represent an element so as you can see when we create this, we would have to save this file as book demo Java. Why is that? Because book demo contain the main method. As I touch on this also in the last couple of weeks. So we're going to save this file as a book demo Java. And we're going to put it inside a folder or a directory called book pack. And this name needs to be exactly the same as your package name. Otherwise, it would throw an error that it cannot locate it. Then when you use command line to compile this file, what you need to do is you can specify where the book pack folder is located, or you can go to the directory above book pack. So if I put the book pack folder on my desktop, I simply change directory to desktop, CD desktop, and then from there I would be able to compile. So here it explains how you would do that. Also in the lab, I had written down the steps for you. And also in the video, I illustrated that. Now, Let's go back a little bit. Last week we talked about the specifier, how we can control access of members and methods inside each class. As package would contain multiple classes, what you would have is you need to specify how each member or each method can be accessed or cannot be accessed. So if we put it private, we would not be able to 
access. It's only outside of that class. So now um, here it talks about the visibility element of the class is really how you specify your access with private, public, protected, or default. Default meaning that it's going to be equivalent to public where we don't put anything. If you don't put any specification or specifier, it would simply just revert to default and it would treat it as a public. So here it gives you a table where it talks about private member visible within the same class, yes, to default member for the default member, yes. It should see in the same class protected member, yes, public member, yes. But for the private member, it is not visible within the same package by subclass. So if you have a subclass under that class and you had specify private in a superclass, the subclass will not be able to access the private member. Now, if you use default because it's equivalent to public, it's yes. So the main thing is that when you're using private and you're using the the default, uh, you have to think about who is or what needs to be accessed from a specific class. And in the case of inheritance, if you're getting issues with how it cannot access the value that's stored in a variable or using or calling the method, it's possibly because you had specified access private. Um, in the next area, it talks about of the table, it talks about visible within different package by the subclass. So let's say if I have multiple packages, like the earlier example, I have pack one, pack two, pack three, and in these package, I have I have sub class or child classes. Um, what will happen is if I specify certain members as private. I will not be able to access outside of that class even though it's a subclass, okay? And if you're using different packages if you, for non-class, if you specify it as private, you will not be able to access that. So now if you're looking at the default and the member, public gives, it's very trans, it's transparent, it's open access for everything. So that's going to make it visible to everybody, subclass, subclass in different packages, um, et cetera, okay? But the default member, if you're using, if you're using multiple package by subclass, you will not be able to access the members if you specify, if you leave it as the default. So if you have nothing in the front, private, public, nothing there, then you would have issues with accessing subclasses in different packages or non-subclass in different packages, okay? And slightly different than the public is your protected member. And the protected member, if you have it as protected using the protected keyword um, in front of your member name, what will happen is that if you're trying to access from a non-subclass across different packages, it will not allow you to do that. So think about how you want to control access when you're specifying right, your members in your classes and how it's going to inherit into the subclass and relay that across multiple packages. So here it touches, the bullets touch on a little bit more about private. Private member is unaffected by its membership in the package. It's visible only within the actual package and within that class. Um, if the member of the class has no ex explicit access modifier, it is only visible within its package and not outside of its package. So if you don't specify anything, keep in mind that you can only see it within the package. 
if you try to access it from outside of a package from another program outside of that package you're going to run into issues so therefore you will use the default access specification for elements that you wanted to keep private and you can use public if you want it accessible across um, so the top level class can only be in two access level, either default or public. And think about that when you're structuring your program with hierarchy, right? Grandparent, parent, and the child. So the top level is going to be the grandparent, the super class. Keep in mind that it needs to be default where you don't say specify anything or if you specify as public, then you allow access to all its members and its methods. So now um, that the section before explains how there's accessibility within this example program. So first, let's take a look at this. This is a package called book pack. We have a public class book. So book and its members must be public in order to be used by the packages. However, we have it private members here. And so when we create, when we construct the object public book, we construct the object T, A, and D, what will happen is we need to specify that those are going to be, the constructor is going to be public. Then we also need to specify the method is going to be public, even though they were set private up here. So in order to use book, this class book, from another package, you must import in uh, the, the book pack package, okay? So in order to use it, and then R, you can fully qualify its name to include the full package specification. So here is an example on how you can set up another package called book pack exc which is an extension of that and to fully qualify to be able to use it you have to specify that it is part of it's going to use the book from the other package okay so here when we qualify the name we simply use it with the dot operator when we construct the array object. Now for the protected member, a protected member is available for all the subclasses to use, but it is still protected from arbitrary access by the code outside of the package. So if you're thinking about security design, what you can think about is how can I specify protected class and members and methods so that way it can be not accessible outside of its class. Now, in this example, what we did was we change up our private members to protected. That means that when we try to utilize it in a different with a different package, the other package cannot access the still. So but in the book what we did was we can create an ext book which is a subclass and we can extend that class by using a hierarchy structure or so that way we can we have the inheritance or we would need to change our specification to be able to access outside of that. Uh, so here what it's talking about is if we're creating a subclass 
Now, with the protected member, following that example, with the protected member here, what we have is we would, for this package, we would have the to set up a subclass called book and call it for under book and call it ext book. So with its subclass, how do I know it's a subclass and, and the extension of that? So here we use the extends keyword and it's extending from the book based on the book path. So you have to, to fully qualify the name. Where is that class coming from? Which package it's using or it's, it's in. So we're saying here's the package and here's the class. And ex ext book is an extension of the book class in the book pack package. And it's able to access the members even though it was protected. Okay. So to get around that, you have to think about how we would be able to have accessibility based on how you specify the members or it, that class. Here, when we change it all to public, what happens is, yes, definitely it's going to be able to access all of the methods, get title, set title, and all of this, and return it. So that way we can utilize the return value to be able to print that out down here. So in the protect demo, this is the main program functionality. It's going to have these array, this array, which contain the elements for the books. So to print it, as we have it public with the method here, we can call it down here. And we are able to access those as we call them. Now, when it gets to this part, book zero, as it, it is protected, it's gonna not allow it because it's by a non subclass. So when it's going through and if we're looking at just the dot title for the test title, it's gonna give, it's gonna throw an error here for this line. Okay, as it is a non subclass. So now what we can do is we can create different packages and we can import in each of the package or we can import in many. So you can have a package like book pack and you can import in using the import keyword we would say import and then the package and class name so we use a dot operator we put the package name and we put the class name so you can bring in specific class from a certain package using the import statement you can import in the entire package by saying import book pack or you can say import book pack dot book demo so we can specify each which class from which package or we can just simply import in the entire package. Now we can use the asterisk to indicate basically that just a, a placeholder for whichever class that's in the my pack. So if you want to import the entire content of the package, we can simply use the asterisk for the class name. We then we don't have to type in the exact class name. But if you know of the class name, you can specify it by using putting the class name after the dot operator. So on this page, it shows you how you can use the import statement. And you would see this similarly across all object oriented language. Uh, so the example we see here is we're using import and we're using all the content from book pack. And so 
what we're doing here is we're creating an, a package and we're going to import the content from another package called book pack and then we would be able to iterate through and pull in the content from the other package so that way we can iterate through our element which are books to show the information so as the other package would have methods for us to be able to access uh, you know different areas of that program so now with the java library these are some of the common sub packages so far we've used java.io this contains io classes sometime you would see program or you can create program that use java lang that's going to contain large number of general purpose classes um, and then we can have java.net which supports networking if you need to establish connections for servers um, java.util this is going to be for utility classes um, including collection framework and collections uh, framework is often implemented for data structure purposes uh, java awt this supports abstract window toolkit so here on this page it gives you the detail for with each one and from the table and it also provide a little bit more example on the java.link so now you can explicitly import in the package you must explicitly import in the package as they are sub packages uh, for the java library okay because they are descending um, now lastly i'm going to touch on interface before i wrapped up the lecture for cis 18a so interface is uh defining what the class must do but not how or how how it will do or will it do okay so this is a way that we can think of abstract method it establishes a signature for a method but provides no implementation it simply is just a signature and the subclass must provide its own implementation of each abstract method defined by its superclass the abstract method specify the interface to the method but not the implementation so you can separate the class interface from its implementation using the keyword interface and interface is like an it's just an abstract class where you can specify more methods that you would have without having to define what each of the method would be so an interface specify what must be done but not how to do it so once the interface is defined any number of the classes can implement it so you can define the interface and then you can implement it in various classes the class in the class itself then you would specify the implementation or the body which contain the methods that's going to be defined for that interface so we're going to take a look at the example since jdk8 is when we can have interface and so top level interface needs to be public or not use and you need to declare it as you can declare it as public interface so that way you can use it with other code if you have it as private just like all the other components you will not be able to utilize it so public is going to allow you to use it with any other code methods are declared using only their return type and signature and these are known as abstract methods so make sure you know what an abstract method is for the final exam and how 
to implement interface. So here is a snippet of how that would look like. Okay, we would have public interface and the interface series. Okay. And we would have the method return next number in the series. So int get next void reset void reset start. And that's going to be the methods. We don't need to define these methods inside the interface. We simply interface with the class. So what we want is we want the class. Its name extends to the superclass and implement interface. So to implement the interface for the class, <coughs> you would have to start with the class, its name. If it's a subclass, we would do an extend, the superclass name, and then we would use implement, and then the interface name. And then you would have the class body. So to implement more than one interface, the interface must be separated by comma. So I would have to add in the next interface and then the next interface, etc. Okay. Now with the extends, the class is optional as that would be in the subclass. So if you're using a subclass of another class and to implement the interface for that or multiple interfaces, you would be able to use it this way. So what that does is it creates a signature. So that way the method will be matched up with how it's defined in the other in the class. So let's look at this example. This is an example for by two and by twos is a class. This class implements the inner, the, the series int start and int val. And under that, what we have is we have initialized start at zero and val at zero. So we construct start and val and we assign it zero. Then here is where we start defining our method. We would say this is a public method called get next. And this is what it does. It's going to increment by two. It's going to return the value. And we want it since it's returning value, we have to have it public here. On the next one, this is another method called reset. This one doesn't return, but you need to have access outside of it. So we need to make sure that it's public. And val is going to be the same as start. So it's going to be zero. The next method is going to be set start. And it's going to use the value from the value for x. Start is going to be the same as x and val is going to be the same as x. Is, is x. So here what you can see is first you start with the class, its name, and you're going to use the keyword implement and then the series interface. Then you simply have the member variables. And then you can simply have the construct the, the constructor and then initialize the value. Then we would then go into each of the method specification where we would define each of the method what it's doing. Okay. So now we have a second class called class series demo. This has the main and it's going to bring down the by two by creating, constructing an object called OB. We have a for loop to iterate through to really obtain 
the next number and it's going to go up to it's going to stop at four it's going to go right to up to five so it's going to stop at four and then we're going to use the object to be able to call the method get next which we previously defined when we have it spec we define it for in the interface okay so what we can do is we can have two programs and it would be interacting with each other one is going to be containing the abstract methods and then the other is going to be calling the methods that would be specified in the interface so on the next one here we would have the object ob and it's going to call reset again we have a for loop it's going to start at zero go up to four and it's going to generate the the value the next value is and it's going to do the get next for the reset then we have 100 plugin for x and we would then use the object to be able to call get next again or access get next so we would have two four six eight ten it's going to reset and it's going to do two four six eight ten again and then it's going to start at 100 100 102, 104S, it's going to increment by 2. So, what this does is that we allow the common classes to implement interface to define additional members of their own. And we are going to change up the program and making it more extensive in that it would use get previous method. So here it's going to implement series and it's going to get, it's going to use the get previous method. So similar to that one, we then would add a method that's not defined by series, return from it. Or what we can do is we can implement series in a different way. So here it shows you example on how you can implement you can implement an interface and you will be able to access various methods from from that interface. Now if the class includes an interface but does not fully implement the methods defined in that interface, the class must be declared as abstract. And that's important to note because no object of such class can be created, but it can be used as an abstract superclass, allowing the subclass to provide a complete implementation. You can also use interface for reference variable. And this example shows you how you can establish that. So just like the last one, what happens is here what we have is we we have a by two implement series. We bring in the series content and then we would have the methods return and these are the public like what we've seen before. We have another class called by threes. It's going to implement series and it's going to have the object and its own methods that's going to be publicly accessed and then lastly we would have the main inside series demo and in this what we would do is we would then bring in the object we could construct the object for by twos and by threes and then here is where we would have the series object okay now to access an object with the interface reference, we simply would have it, this print line from the get next and get next is coming from the by twos. Okay, so OB is able to, OB is the object, it's able to interface through series to be able to utilize by threes method. 
So here it explains OB is declared as a reference to the series interface. It can be used to store the references of any object implements in the series. It is used to refer to 2OB and 3OB, which are objects of by twos and by threes respectively, which both implement series. So you're able to access both both areas from by twos and by threes through series and creating the object from the series. You can also extend interface just like how we would extend in a class. So if you want an interface to inherit another interface, you simply can use the keyword extends and that is going to carry down the inheritance across or between the interfaces. Okay, so here we see that we can implement interface B that's going to be an extension of A. And notice that the interface A, we simply just have, we just declare the method but not define it. And then again, declare and not define it. And for the, cl the classes, then we can start implementing how each of the method would be executed. Okay. And also the object. Here's the one down here is the main. That's going to be how to create. We construct the object and use those objects to call the methods. Now the default interface, default interface, uh, Methods specified by an interface were abstract containing no body. The default method lets you define the default implementation of an interface method. So if you keep it default, it would automatically revert to the default interface method. But if you make it public, then it becomes accessible. That means that we can have different ways to implement or extend the body or change the body abstractedly uh, by controlling how the interface is used or accessed. So please look over the example. I know that I implemented the exercises for your lab. Uh, take a look at it, go through the notes and learn a little bit more about how you can use interface. This will be useful in your future courses and also if you wanted to develop in Java, this is important to understand. Um, now the interface and class, and class can maintain the state of information, but interface cannot because interface is really just abstract. So you would revert to the class where the class would maintain the state of the information. Okay. And furthermore, it goes into the default methods and provide you with the example on how it would use the default method. Where we have here, B in, is an extension of A. A has these methods declared. Uh, and down here in the B, we implement B to my class. And then we, we would then specify the method access and we would be able to call it in the next class okay so that gives you an understanding on how to be able to use interface in your program and you know outside of using packages we touched on packages earlier but how you can use interface and extend the interfaces um, and then implement that into your main program. And this would conclude my part one video, which explains packages, how to import packages and use interface. Please take a look at the example on the interfaces, go through the explanation, try the example so you can better understand how the methods are used. Uh, the accessibility level, especially with the default method. And we touch on how it should be default or public. 
but it gives you a little bit more explanation on how you can use default and inheritance across classes in the interfaces.